Hello, my name is Orton Ortwine, and I am here to talk to you today about the exciting world of Ray Bradbury and the world of comics. So my name is Orty Ortwine, and I volunteer for the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum, an organization I'll talk more about at the end. So let's go back to the beginning. So this is what Bradbury wrote in the 1980 handout for San Diego Comic-Con. Quote, I have never got over the initial impact of Buck Rogers on my life, and I am grateful for his explosion in my midst sometime in the year 1929, when the newspaper thudded against the screen door of my home in Waukegan, Illinois. So he is referring to his childhood in Waukegan, which is where the museum is located. And indeed, as a child, Bradbury obsessively collected his favorite newspaper strips from the local papers, from Waukegan and Chicago newspapers. And that there that you see on the right, that is just one box. And that is courtesy of something called the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies at IUPUI. That is a university in Indianapolis, Indiana. Many thanks to John Eller for use of this image. So that's just one box. He had something like 24 scrapbooks full of these newspaper strips. You know, there, there were no comic books back then in the late 20s and early 30s. So Bradbury is kind of making his own. So these favorite strips of his included Buck Rogers. And again, this is an original image. So that was what Bradbury himself scrapbooked as a child. Tarzan. And there on the left, you see an ad for Tarzan on WBBM, which is still playing in the Chicago area. So these strips clearly came from one of the Chicago newspapers. And also Flash Gordon was another favorite of Bradbury's. Now briefly, Bradbury stopped collecting. And then again, this is from the booklet of the San Diego Comic-Con 1980. Kids made fun. I took on embarrassment and tore up the strips. A month later, empty, I burst into tears and asked myself what was wrong. The answer, Buck Rogers was gone, and life not worth living. Damn, I must have cried, or darn anyway. And I started collecting Buck Rogers all over again. Since that day, I have never listened to anyone about my tastes. So at this point, Bradbury's only about nine years old, but it's a very important point in his life. He just after that, he just decides, I'm going to love what I love and do what I do, and I just don't care what the rest of the world thinks. This was long before collecting comics or geek culture was anything like cool, but he has already decided that he's just going to do his own thing, and he doesn't care what the world thinks of that. So now when he was a very little boy, he sort of first begins getting paid by the comics industry. So when they were when he was 11 years old, the Bradburys briefly lived in Tucson, Arizona for about a year. And he was a very bold child, and it was a very different time. This is circa 1931. He just goes to this local radio station and asks for a job. And he gets a job basically as a gopher running errands for the people at the station. And eventually, they gave him the opportunity to read the Sunday funnies on the radio. Radio was another love of Bradbury's. Later, as an adult writer, a lot of his stuff was proudly adapted for radio. So Bradbury jumps to the chance and he read with other children the funnies over the radio, the Cats and Jammer kids, things like that. Now that is not Ray Bradbury that you see there. That's really just a stock image. And they paid him with movie tickets. And Bradbury loved movies. I have a whole separate talk about Bradbury's career in film. So, you know, he must have just been in heaven. He gets to read the comics and he gets paid, you know, with movie tickets. You know, what what 11-year-old boy could be happier? And the question has been asked, are there any recordings of a young Bradbury reading these comics? Unfortunately not. My guess would be that they never recorded them to begin with. In the old days, radio stations did not typically record every broadcast. So, now the first time that Bradbury gets professional with comics comes under a sort of an odd set of circumstances. So the May-June 52 issue of Weird Fantasy, that was one of the EC comics. EC comics are much better known for The Haunt of Fear and Tales from the Crypt. They did those notorious horror comics in the early 50s. They also had a line of science fiction comics. 
1952, Weird Fantasy had a story that looks suspiciously like a mashup of two of Bradbury's stories, Kaleidoscope and Rocket Man. And especially the ending. I won't give away the ending, but when you see how that particular issue ends and how the Kaleidoscope, Bradbury's story ends, it really can't be a coincidence. So Bradbury has basically been plagiarized, or that's how he sees it anyway. And this actually wasn't the first time. There were a couple of other issues that had stories that looked suspiciously like Bradbury's stories. It was no secret that the gentleman running EC Comics, Bill Gaines, was known for reading various pulp magazines where Bradbury was publishing as a source of what he called inspiration. So Bradbury was always very defensive of his work, but he handles it very tactfully. So he sends this letter to Bill Gaines. Just a note to remind you of an oversight. You have not as yet sent on the check for $50 to cover the use of my secondary rights on my two stories. I feel this was probably overlooked in the general confusion of the office work and look forward to your payment in the near future. So he's very tactful about it. And something very interesting that Bradbury says at the end of that same letter, have you ever considered doing an entire issue of your magazine based on my stories in Dark Carnival or my other two books, The Illustrated Man and The Martian Chronicles? So he's basically asking Gaines to adapt his entire books that of Bradbury. The Illustrated Man and The Martian Chronicles and Dark Carnival are the only three books Bradbury has published at this point. They are all compilations of his short stories. So what he's really calling for is a book-length comic book or otherwise known as a graphic novel. And, you know, this is in the 50s. Nobody was doing that back then. So Bradbury is very much ahead of his time. So Bill Gaines compromises, sort of. This is his reply. Although we do not agree with your conclusions, we are enclosing our check for $50 without intending to agree with your contentions. So we didn't do anything wrong, but fine, here's a check. <laughs> And so Gaines also did not feel that an issue devoted to Bradbury was feasible. So this is just the graphic novel, you know, that concept just doesn't exist yet. But he does agree to adapt more of his stories. So a total of 27 Bradbury stories were adapted by EC Comics. And these are some of Bradbury's best known stories, his greatest hits, really. A Sound of Thunder was one of them. That is artwork by Al Williamson. Wally Wood, another very well-known artist of the time, adapted There Will Come Soft Rains, Mars is Heaven, and many others. Really, most of Bradbury's best-known stories had comic book adaptations by EC Comics. Now, 16 of these illustrated adaptations were later collector, uh, collected in two volumes. Tomorrow Midnight and the Autumn People. These are black and white recreations of the original EC comics. So the graphic novel that Bradbury called for kind of existed later. Now Bradbury came under pressure to end his relationship with EC basically because of the reputation comics had at the time. Something Bradbury struggled with his whole life was being taken seriously as a, quote, real writer, because he wrote science fiction. And at this time in the 50s, science fiction still has this reputation as silly, if not downright damaging to, the, to youth. And a lot of people felt that Bradbury should not be palling around with comics, because after all, if he's trying to be taken seriously as a real writer, well, what is he doing with comic books? Because at best, they were seen as juvenile, and Bradbury had recently, quote, graduated to the slicks. So he began publishing in those cheap, pulpy magazines, you know, weird tales and amazing stories and things like that. But recently he had been getting stuff published in the higher end, better paying, glossy magazines like Mademoiselle there on the left. And Saturday Evening Post was another one that published a lot of his works later, Playboy. So he's <clears throat> finally starting to get taken more seriously as a writer. And just as an aside, the editor who decided to publish Bradbury was a young man by the name of Truman Capote. 
So Bradbury's getting pretty good company here. Well, you know, writing for these silly comic books, that's not going to help his reputation at all. You realize this was way, way before you had respected writers like Margaret Atwood and Stephen King having their stuff adapted into comics. You know, it may be very trendy now, but this was not the case in the 1950s. Real writers, quote unquote, would not be seen palling around with comics. And at worst, comics were seen as a cause of juvenile delinquency. So there on the left is the cover of the book Seduction of the Innocent by Frederick Wertham, a highly respected psychologist who argued that comic books were leading to children to turn to juvenile delinquency, sexual deprivation, including, oh my goodness, homosexuality. And he was taken very seriously. And that's Bertram right there doing what he does best, being offended. And incredibly, there were even these bizarre, there was kind of like a mass hysteria. For a brief time in the early 50s, there were these bizarre purges where they would encourage children to turn in their comic books and they would then burn these comic books in public squares. And you can't really read the caption on the picture on the left, but I believe that particular gathering was organized by the JCs. So this gives you an idea of who's doing this. I mean, churches, civic groups, public schools are all participate, participating in these comic book burnings. And I would love to say that the comic book burnings directly led to Fahrenheit 451. Uh, however, at this point, Bradbury at least had a rough draft of Fahrenheit 451 already written, but still... It had to be bizarre for him to see his own dystopia sort of coming to life. So in this atmosphere, Bradbury acquiesced slightly. He did ask that his name no longer appear on the cover of the comic books. And his was the only writer's name that ever appeared on the cover of EC Comics. Now, it may be disappointing that Bradbury seemingly knuckled under, but realize the smartest thing for him to do here is just to end his relationship with EC, period. I mean, at this time, EC Comics was considered the worst of the worst comics, the, the most deprived, and Bradbury is not really making very much money. He gets paid, in today's money, it would be something like $250, maybe $500 per adaptation. So really, he's not getting much out of this. The only reason he is doing any of this is because he still has this childlike glee for comics, and he just thinks that this is so neat. He not only wrote to Bill Gaines, but he also wrote numerous letters of praise to the individual artists, and he gave in his opinion about which artists he wanted to adapt, which works. So he's very much into this. All he asks is that his name no longer appear on the covers. They would still adapt his stories. He would still work with EC Comics until the end. And the end comes quickly, so... The U.S. Senate had hearings led by a gentleman named Senator Kefauver to investigate juvenile delinquency. Really, they were investigations into comic books. And at these hearings, Gaines came forward and testified. And I wish I could show you the cover. It's actually this particular issue is now highly sought after collectors because of this moment they go for something like $8,000 a pop. So Gaines held up a comic book that showed a picture of a woman's severed head being held up by a guy who apparently just cut her head off. And he said that he felt that this was in good taste. I believe the exact quote was, bad taste would be holding the head a little bit higher so you could see her bloody tendons coming down. So that did not go over well. A lot of people say Gaines's testimony was more damning than anything Frederick Vertum had done. Vertum incidentally had also testified so after this, the comic book industry decides to censor itself. So that little emblem you see on the left, if a comic book did not have that emblem, now this was not a government code, that's an important point, this is self-regulation, but if a comic book did not have that little stamp of approval on it, the major distributors would not carry it. And back then, your comic book was not going to end up in drugstores and places like that without the distributors. And so, and this, that little stamp, you can see those on comics as recently as the early 90s. It would stay for some, quite some time, and it was a very draconian code that comics had to follow. They, they couldn't have words like eerie or weird in the title, which was what a lot of the EC comics had. So in some ways, it seemed to be a direct attack on EC. There were all kinds of weird rules. Law enforcement always had to be showed in a positive light, et cetera, et cetera.
So EC Comics could not go by these new rules, and Gaines would go on to found Mad Magazine with some of the same artists who contributed to EC. So the whole reason to this day it is known as Mad Magazine is by calling itself a magazine, it did not have to follow these rules. And that's why Mad Magazine was always put on the news rack with Time and Newsweek. And it had a glossy cover, but then cheap black and white pages on the inside. And Bradbury never really forgot this. So decades later, this is what he wrote in Bradbury Comics number four, and more on Bradbury Comics in a moment. Quote, I was put upon by professional psychologists and social reformers who told us that fantasy was bad for children. One learned professor managed to get quite a few comics books banned for many years. And now this is a sentence he added to his short story, Usher 2. This sentence was not originally in the story. He added it for the Ray Bradbury comics. Quote, all the tales of terror and fantasy, and for that matter, tales of the future were heartlessly, were burned heartlessly. They began by controlling books of cartoons. So it's been about 40 years at this point, but Bradbury has not forgotten nor forgiven. And then quite ironically, the good Dr. Vertum, his last book was called The World of Fanzines, where of all things, he praised comic fanzines. And he even tried to address an audience at the 1974 New York Comic Art Convention, but was booed off the stage. And so speaking of conventions, so Bradbury was a guest speaker at the very first Comic-Con San Diego in 1970. Only 300 people attended. It was in the basement of a hotel. And there on the left, you can sort of see the lineup. So at two o'clock, there's Jack Kirby. And then three hours later, there was a talk by Ray Bradbury. It was a very different time, a very low key event. And Bradbury would go to every Comic-Con San Diego almost every year after. He really stopped going only when his failing health just made it unfeasible. And so there he is, I'm thinking this is circa 1980, surrounded by fans. He loved to autograph things. He loved to be loved. He was a very approachable guy. And backing up somewhat, he not only went to the first Comic-Con San Diego, he went to what is considered the great granddaddy of all cons, and that is the World Science Fiction Convention in 1939. Now it's just known as Worldcon, and it's still going on. It meets every year in another city. That's where the Hugo Awards are presented. So Bradbury is in the car there. He's the gentleman on the far right in the striped shirt. And at the time, he was broke. He was only about 19 years old. So his good buddy, Forey Ackerman, who himself became the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland, Forey Ackerman also had the world's largest collection of horror and science fiction memorabilia, he lent Bradbury the money so he could take a Greyhound bus to Worldcon. And there, Forey Ackerman is posing with his girlfriend, and it was actually his girlfriend's idea, a woman named Myrtle Douglas, to come in costume. They are the first cosplayers. Now, a dream Bradbury always had was to have his own Sunday morning comic strip. And there were proofs drawn up for some, a Martian Chronicles comic strip, but unfortunately, it really didn't go much past this stage. It was adapted by West Magazine. That was the magazine of the LA Times. It came with the Sunday paper. Uh, one issue, Mars is Heaven, was adapted, but unfortunately, it went no further than that. So in 1985, DC adapted a series of science fiction stories, including Frost and Fire by Ray Bradbury. And others adapted in that series were Harlan Ellison and George R.R. R. Martin, so it's a very exclusive company. So it wasn't until the 90s that Bradbury finally got a comic book devoted to him and even a graphic novel, this idea he came up with 40 years earlier. So in the 80s and early 90s, software developer Brian Price designed two Bradbury video games. Believe it or not, there was a text-based Fahrenheit 451 video game in the 80s, and then in the 90s, a Martian Chronicles video game. And the artist that Price assembled 
for this project would later develop the Bradbury Chronicles, and that was a series of graphic novel adaptations of Bradbury's best-known writing. And the Bradbury Chronicles were eventually adapted into Ray Bradbury comics, and these are just regular flimsy comics that you could buy at the comic book store. And they were adopted, adapted by, of all people, Topps Comics. So this is Topps, yes, this is the baseball card company. In the 90s, there was kind of an explosion of companies trying their hand at comics. This is when, this is after the first Batman movie, a lot of companies realized for the first time, wow, we could actually make funny uh, money with these silly, funny comic books. So Topps, briefly, from 92 to 98, had a comics division, and they tended to adapt a lot of already existing works. They also had an X-Files comics. They had a series of comics based on the Dracula movie that came out at that time. And the best part of, of the Ray Bradbury comics is because this is tops after all. So each issue of Ray Bradbury comics came with Ray Bradbury trading cards. They would depict scenes from his different stories. So collect them all. Topps also did one-off adaptations of The Martian Chronicles and The Illustrated Man. Uh, however, due to space limitations, these were partial adaptations. You see there, Illustrated Man number one. I'm not sure if they had planned to do more and that just never happened or what, but there was only one of each. So shortly before his death in 2012, Ray would see three of his best-known works fully adapted into graphic novel form. That's Fahrenheit 451, The Martian Chronicles, and Something Wicked This Way Comes. And they were published between 2009 and 2011 by a company called Hill and & Wang. And they are actually a very serious graphic novel company. Probably their best known work is an illustrated version of the 9-11 Commission Report. They also did a lot of nonfiction graphic novels. So it says something about how seriously Bradbury is now being taken, that this is the company that is adapting his works. And then shortly after his death, now there was a book called Shadow Show, a book in which numerous authors wrote stories that were inspired or based on works of Ray Bradbury. And these are some very well-known people. You see there, Margaret Atwood, Harlan Ellison, Neil Gaiman, and so on, Joe Hill. And there was a series of comics that were based on this book, and those two were eventually collected into graphic novel form. And then in 2010, Comic-Con began handing out something called the Icon Award. This is an award reserved for people who have been instrumental in creating greater awareness of and appreciation for comic books and related popular art forms. And Bradbury was one of the first to receive this award. And I think that is wholly appropriate since this is the guy who scrapbook comics as a kid, defended comics at a time when they were publicly being burned in squares, and saw comics all the way through. And also, of course, went to the first comic book convention way back in 1970. And that would actually be his last Comic-Con in 2010. He died on June 6, 2012. And there you see the Icon Award. And so just a nod, make sure you go to the website of the Ray Bradbury Experience Museum. So if you're watching this, you've probably already bought a ticket and donated already, but you can become a, you can get our, our newsletter, get updates. We are partially open now. We hope, and, hope to open full time in the very near future. So thank you very much. And there we have a GoFundMe campaign going on. And you can also visit the website or see us on Facebook for more information. So thank you very much.